India, uh, Professor Abhijit uh, uh, Wahangurkar uh, from India. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, sir. And uh, Professor Ahmad Alam from Egypt, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, I would like to thank my dear friend, uh, Dr. Sernivas, for his great effort to arrange such a webinar. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, first of all, we will introduce uh, Professor Abhijit and Dr. Sarnivas will be the moderator of the first presentation. Please, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. So, uh, as always, thank you, uh, Professor Allah Shab. It's a pleasure uh, to be with you and uh, with the Egyptian Orthopedic Association. Uh, and, and it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker for today's talk. Uh, he is uh, well known among Indian orthopedic surgeons. He's Professor Abhijit Vaghe Gonkar, um, and he's a renowned uh, and accomplished expert in the field of wrist and hand surgery in India and abroad. Uh, he has a brief account of his uh, uh, profile and achievements. He's basically from Pune, which is a very fine city in India, on the west of India. Uh, he's a, he is an adjunct professor of hand surgery and distinguished uh, clinical tutor of orthopedic surgery um, and director of upper limb hand and microsurgery. Um, uh, he's a consultant at Jahangir Hospital. And uh, so he's had his uh, fellowships in hand uh, done in, um, in Japan, in Paris, and at Mayo uh, Clinic in the USA. He's editor-in-chief of uh, Journal of Trauma and Orthopedic Surgery. He's a section editor in uh, uh, JASSM and reviewer of uh, uh, Journal of Hand Surgery. He's uh, had 42 peer-reviewed publications and 12 textbook chapters, and has re read more than 300 papers in conferences and 80 invited talks in international and national uh, uh, conferences. And he's founding president of Risk Society of India, vice president of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, um, he's a member of uh, uh, multiple uh, committees, in, including uh, the SICOT and Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, uh, Fellowship Committee, and IOA, uh, sorry, Indian Arthro Arthroscopy Asso Society, and Pune Orthopedic Society. Uh, he'll be talk talking to us on wrist arthroscopy today. We are fortunate to have uh, Professor Vahe Gonkar here today to share his experience and insights on this interesting topic. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Vijit. Um, you can take the... Uh, right. uh, good um, evening, everyone. Uh, esteemed professors um, and uh, friends and colleagues, Professor Srinivas, thank you so much for that uh, introduction and especially for the invitation for this great initiative on uh, educating our colleagues, sharing with them our thoughts and uh, under the aegis of the Indian Orthopedic Association and the Egyptian Orthopedic Association. It is indeed a great honor and a rare privilege for me. My task today is uh, to talk about um, wrist arthroscopy, and then um, I will be sharing some thoughts on the role of wrist arthroscopy and uh, how can we use uh, this tool in decision-making in hand and wrist surgery especially uh, with reference to uh, injury, perhaps, and then a few examples of extended indications. And I do not have any conflict of interest regarding this presentation. Now, when we talk of wrist arthroscopy, it falls under the umbrella of small joint arthroscopy, which includes joints like the wrist per se, and then several smaller joints like the CMC joint, the metacarpophalangeal joint, and then there have been sporadic reports about uh, scopy, um, especially diagnostic application of um, arthroscopy, the PIP as well. And then there are endoscopic procedures and uh, involvement of foot and TM joint, which kind of uh, uh, completes the array of small joint arthroscopy. The history of arthroscopy uh, goes back way back into 1970s when Professor Watanabe from Japan um, and then Bircher also way before him introduced uh, telescopes into joints initially in cadavers and then into um, human subjects. And then arthroscopy has evolved over the years and we have 
uh, on this slide a list of people who have contributed to our understanding and advancing science. The bottom of the slide especially talks about people who have contributed to wrist arthroscopy. And I think I'm very, very privileged and very honored to have been mentored and tutored by most of these people and uh, having them as friends and colleagues to date. So why small joint arthroscopy? Why did this develop? I think it was a natural extension from larger joints to start scoping small joints. And especially with the advent of high-end optics and cameras and scopes, we are able to see uh, stuff within the joint uh, with magnification and greater resolution, much like uh, in the eye of the needle. And uh, a lot of people now agree um, after this publication in 1979 that uh, wrist arthroscopy is not only a gold standard as a diagnostic school or tool, but also a technique of choice for the treatment of several disorders of the wrist joint, which are listed in this particular slide. But this is not an exhaustive list because the indications are expanding and growing as the uh, techniques and the instrumentation is also improving. This slide summarizes more or less uh, the different procedures that can be performed. And it's really uh, incredible that we are able to perform so many procedures in this small joint. So you have soft tissue procedures and bone procedures, and they can be grouped as diagnostic, ectomy procedures, shrinkage procedures, releases, uh, reparative, as well as reconstructive procedures. So it's quite an interesting application of a technique uh, that can allow you to do several different procedures in a minimally invasive manner. Um, this video is a brief uh, kind of a video to show the standard arthroscopic setup, which begins with uh, marking the portals and then um, the surface markings, which allow you entry into the wrist joint and then uh, perform different procedures that will uh, help you uh, deal with different pathologies. Um, but then the basic of any technique is lies in the details. Like we say, the devil lies in the details. So the sequence of viewing, if kept standard, will allow you to never miss any pathology. So the arthroscopic anatomy is extremely important. And this slide shows you the different articular surfaces, uh, such as the uh, scaphoid fossa, the lunate fossa, the ridge between these two fossae, the scaphoid proximal pole, the lunate, and then the triquetrum, which is a little difficult to visualize from the radiocarpal joint. Nevertheless, it can be seen along with the different ligaments, uh, which are highlighted in this particular slide, which includes the TFCC, the scapholunate, and the lunotriquetral ligament, uh, the short and the long radiolunate ligaments, which are called as the ligaments of testute, and so on and so forth. I won't belabor too much on this in the interest of time. And then uh, we also move on to the uh, mid-carpal joint after the sequence of viewing is complete. We, uh, I like to keep it from radial to ulna, from uh, distal to proximal, and then soft tissue and bone uh, together. So this is a, a video to show you uh, what we just discussed about. As you can see, this is the ligament of test tooth. We are going uh, from radial this is the proximal pole of the scaphoid onto the waist of the scaphoid. You have on the lateral side, the collateral ligament or the soft tissue on the radial side. And then as you uh, move your scope all the way up, you can see the reflection of the capsule onto the waist of the scaphoid. And then you come back to the center of the joint. This is the lighthouse, the ligament of testute, which corresponds superior, superiorly to the scaphoid ligament and then as you move towards the ulnar side, you would put into evidence or you will be able to observe the, oops, my video has hung up. Uh, I'm sorry, just give me a brief moment, please. So for some reason, my... I'll just share my screen again. I'm I'm sorry for that uh, yeah. snag. My PowerPoint just gave up on me. I'm terribly sorry about that. 
All right. PowerPoint is asking you for some update. Uh, PowerPoint is it? No, I think uh, it is. Uh, it's it's come back again. So okay. I I think uh, I will be able to share the screen and then. And it's last minute problems that I. Okay, Zoom. Share screen. Okay, here we go. I hope my screen is visible now. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. I'm I'm terribly sorry about that snag. So uh, we then move on to the mid carpal joint again, um, which comprises of the proximal carpal row, uh, the trapezium and the trapezoid, the capitate and the hamate proximal pole, so that you can then identify the different ligament structures as well as the uh, cartilage and the bony anatomy. And then as you view sequentially, your examination uh, will be very, very standardized and we will not miss any uh, pathologies. Here is a video to show, this is a dry arthroscopy to show you the mid carpal anatomy. What you have at the superior edge of the screen is the head of the capitate. I'm putting my probe into the uh, scaphalunate aspect. We, we palpate the cartilage at the head of the capitate, scaphalunate interval, and then as you move uh, towards the ulnar aspect, you will then come across, that is a lunate, that is the cornu of the lunate, dorsal cornu of the lunate, and then you would see your lunotriquital joint as well. So this is the usual, um, you know, standard setup as well as the uh, arthroscopic anatomy. Well, the therapeutic indications were studied by a French group wherein they looked at 2,000 cases and they found that uh, more than 38% uh, of the indications were for ligament injuries, about 11% were fractures, and uh, ganglion excision accounted for about 18 to 20%, and then several different procedures such as synovectomy, arthrolysis, as, a, as well as partial arthrodesis for different conditions accounted for about 16% of uh, cases. Here is a case in point, a 40-year-old female homemaker presented with uh, pain in the wrist joint, uh, which increased with strenuous work. And on examination, we found that uh, there was tenderness on the other aspect of the, of the wrist joint. The belotment as the foveal sign were positive. And uh, examination under anesthesia revealed that there was a DRU development in three rotations, that is pronation, mid-prone, and supination. And the MRI also corresponded or confirmed the clinical diagnosis of a TFCC injury. Uh, when we went in, this is a uh, DRUJ portal wherein you can see the fovea and the uh, synovitis and the avulsion of the TFCC from the base of the fovea and then an arthroscopic repair of this ligament can be performed. Uh, what we do is we use two of fiber wire and a mini push lock to anchor the TFCC back, and then usually reliably we can restore the uh, DRUJ stability uh, after the procedure is done. Uh, and then again, you test it in three rotations to be sure that the stability is intact. Um, what about other ligament injuries? Scaphalunate ligament injury perhaps is also one of the most frequent uh, case uh, presentations we have in quotidian practice. Here's a case in point of a 42-year-old right hand dominant male uh, who had a history of fall, was treated uh, conservatively, but the pain did not reduce. Clinically, we found the Watson's test uh, to be positive with restriction of range of movement and reduced grip strength. We had a differential of either a fracture of the scaphoid, a wrist pain, or a scaphalunate ligament injury. And um, uh, these are standard X-rays that uh, reveal that there is perhaps a uh, increased gap between the scaphoid and the lunate, the so-called Terry Thomas sign, along with the uh, DC deformity, which is evident here uh, with the increased uh, scaphalunate angle. Uh, CT scans also confirm the same. You can see that there is a dorsal translation of the scaphoid on the coronal view. The scaphoid is now sitting much on the dorsal lip of the radius. The increased scaphalunate uh, distance on a coronal view. This is a sagittal view, I'm sorry. And then again, we also see the DC deformity on this particular slide with the MRI corroborating our uh, finding. 
So the treatment of these injuries usually depends on the classification, on your uh, on the preference and the training and experience of the surgeon, and also the needs and expectations of the patients. However, uh, we all have grown up with this aphorism from Dr. Berger from the Mayo Clinic, who said that treatment of scapulonic dissociation is difficult, not always predictable, and seldom entirely satisfactory. However, we do have uh, recent uh, evidence and uh, more and more uh, publications that corroborate that this can be successful if you keep these considerations in mind. These were published by Dr. Mark Garcia Elias, who is a famous risk surgeon from Spain. And he takes into consideration these six questions and the answers to these questions will give you the stage to in which this ligament injury is. And the answers are very simple yeses and nos, which classify the ligament injury from stage one to stage seven. And usually if we have a dynamic instability, that is to say, stay, say that the scaphoid is reducible, we are able to perform arthroscopic repairs. Uh, my mentor, Professor Mathula, and I had the um, uh, I have the, had the privilege to publish uh, this technique with him, wherein we uh, repair the ligament. And this video will help you understand how we do this. We have standard wrist arthroscopy set up. Uh, our visualization portal is a three, four, and a six R portal. We identify the ligament injury, and then you freshen the ligament. And then you pass the sutures from the scaphoid remnant and the lunate remnant of the ligament. And you move to the mid-carpal joint. You withdraw these sutures. And then you tie a Nikki knot. And then you get the ligament and the capsule together to perform a so-called capsule ligament desis. This technique has been termed as the arthroscopic dorsal capsule ligamentous repair. So this is an arthroscopic clinical picture to this is the mid carpal joint wherein we have identified the ligament injury freshened it. Here is one of the sutures coming in from uh, one of the uh, remnants, the scaphoid remnant, the lunate remnant, and we are visualizing from the six hour portal. We get these sutures out, retrieve them through the radial mid carpal portal, and then after that, once you have tied the knot and you pull on the knot, the scaphoid and the lunate come together and then you have a nice secure repair with two OPDS. And you can expect reasonably good outcomes, return of range of movement, as well as strength, which is comparable on both sides with this minimally invasive techniques. There are other injuries that can also be addressed with uh, wrist arthroscopy, pretty much like we have for knee uh, proximal tibia fractures, wherein there is a depressed fragment. The central depressed fragment can be elevated arthroscopically, and the and the uh, the reduction can be assessed for adequacy and for uh, congruity. This technique was popularized by uh, Professor Del Pinal from Santander, Spain. Uh, we also have indications wherein we can use wrist arthroscopy for scaphoid fractures, both acute as well as chronic, wherein we identify the fracture site, we freshen it up, and you can pass your screws percutaneously to get uh, compression across the fracture site and the adequacy of the reduction can also be assessed and verified. Um, advanced uh, instrumentation has also allowed for bone grafting to be done. And there are several authors who have now abandoned vascularized bone grafting for chronic non-unions. So when we were performing these very open uh, and large procedures, large incision procedures, the same surgery can now be performed with arthroscopy wherein we uh, bring in small curettes and burrs and shavers to freshen the fracture non-union site, and then uh, bring in your bone graft, either from ilia crest or from the distal radius using J needles, and we impact the bone graft using uh, uh, these minimally invasive techniques and uh, put in the uh, uh, bone graft in the non-union site, and once that is done, you would have a good um, uh, fresh bone, and then you can pass your screw up in a minimally invasive manner. This is a video which shows the bone graft being inserted and impacted into the non-union site, and a very large incision can be over. So the, the argument for doing this procedure is preservation of the biology and the uh, vascularity of the, uh, of the scaphoid. 
uh, Stalidotomy in conditions such as a snack risk can also be performed with a minimally invasive technique. And this also um, is a very nice procedure. The ulna shortening, so the distal ulna resection in unlocal abutment, uh, the so-called Felden procedure is also an indication that can be performed minimally invasive. And uh, early return to work is one of the objectives of these procedures. Uh, distal ulnar resection is usually uh, performed when there is arthroscopic resection is performed when there is no gross DRG instability and the uh, ulna is abutting against the lunate. Ganglion cysts are again a very good indication for those who are desirous of making a foray into wrist arthroscopy. And uh, it is a very rewarding procedure with uh, immediate pain relief and early return to work. Recently, there has been some interest in uh, staging of Keenbjörg's disease. And now there is a new classification, the Beg and Bain classification, which, has, uh, which is an extension of the Lichtman classification, uh, wherein we take into consideration the uh, uh, articular surfaces in the mid-carpal as well as the radiocarpal joint. And that helps you in decision making and uh, the recommendation of the surgery based on what stage or what grade the Keenbjörg disease is present in. And procedures such as uh, proximal rocarpectomy as well as partial wrist fusion can now very well be performed arthroscopically. There are uh, indications that are ex ex expanding and uh, there are newer and newer procedures that have been described. And here is another list that is. Uh, not comprehensive, and uh, we uh, hear about these uh, very um, accomplished arthroscopy surgeons who add to the plethora of procedures and the litany of indications uh, with minimally invasive surgery of the wrist joint. CMC arthroscopy again uh, can be used for um, CMC arthritis, wherein uh, either a complete or a partial trapezectomy can be done. Uh, here we use a 1.9 millimeter scope. Uh, to enter the CMC joint, and then um, you can then perform different procedures such as synovectomy, thermal shrinkage, as well as uh, uh, synovectomy in case of uh, CMC arthritis. So here is a case in point where a rasper is being used to reject the trapezium, and then uh, you can use some interposition materials such as uh, palmaris plongus or even artificial uh, grafts to treat uh, uh, CMC arthritis. So like I said, uh, uh, indications are expanding and this is a paper that we published for a young child who present with relentless pain in the CMC joint. And um, we decided to scope the joint and what we found was a um, nodular um, uh, synovitis, stenosynovitis, which is a rare kind of a case. And again, uh, the child was saved of an extensive procedure. And then um, uh, this is also just an uh, extended ex uh, indication. So in conclusion, wrist arthroscopy is pretty much an established and routine procedure these days. It is not only an adjunct to diagnosis, but does have a very established therapeutic value and the indications are ever expanding. So with that, I thank you for the attention and for the opportunity to present on this forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Vahegronkar, for uh, sharing your uh, uh, experiences and insights on this uh, uh, interesting branch of arthroscopy. Um, I think there are a couple of questions in the uh, this thing uh, from the delegates, actually. Um, thank you. One is from Dr. Islam Tabal. Thank you, sir, for this amazing topic and presentation. Uh, he has about four questions. Uh, first question is, what do you prefer, uh, sir, dry or wet scope? And what is the advantage of one over the other? Um, yeah, thank you so much uh, for the question, uh, Dr. Islam. Uh, dry scopy is becoming more and more popular, and most of the procedures are now performed uh, as a dry arthroscopy especially distal radius fractures. And the advantage of doing this as a dry procedure is that uh, you can perhaps prevent a compartment syndrome which might otherwise result from the fluid seeping into the forearm. Uh, but other than that, 
TFCC repairs, mid carpal arthroscopies are also performed as dry procedures. But I'm not very dogmatic that if I'm performing a dry procedure, I should continue. Sometimes there may be bleeding. Um, the blood needs to be washed away. So intermittent usage of uh, saline or uh, saline to flush the blood out or to when you're doing sinovectomies, the influx of the saline will allow for the tissue to be, uh, you know, resected more effectively. So I uh, use it in tandem, uh, dry and uh, wet arthroscopy to be uh, able to perform any procedure effectively. Uh, so I hope that answers your question, sir. Uh, one a follow-up question from me, actually. What percentage of your procedures are dry scopes and um, how much is wet scope? And you, you must be using tourniquet for all the cases, isn't it? Yes, sir. So we do use a tourniquet. Uh, the space for the working, uh, in the space of working in wrist arthroscopy is from distraction. Uh, so the fluid is not the primary um, source or primary a kind of uh, uh, tool for the space that you're creating. And uh, we always start off uh, uh, with a dry arthroscopy because it gives you a real kind of, of uh, visualization and feel of the tissues and the structures. But like I said, every now and then we use uh, uh, saline to wash out any debris or any tissue that may be present. Uh, when we are doing bone grafting for scapoid non-unions, we make sure that there is no saline ingress because the bone graft can be washed away. Uh, distal radius fractures, again, are usually performed. And even if you have to use saline, we just attach a syringe to the, um, to the saline um, uh, portal, and you can just flush in the saline with your, uh, with your syringe. You need not have any um, you know, PURP set for the saline to inflow into the joint. So percentage-wise, I would say almost all uh, scopies are, uh, uh, we begin as a dry arthroscopy, and then we use uh, saline influx uh, as and when required. Another question from Dr. Islam is, uh, in Kinbox disease, the risk scope uh, have a role in treatment rather than staging? Uh, in both, in fact. So it is, you cannot, in fact, you stage and then you decide the treatment. So say, for example, you put your scope in and you find that uh, it is, say, for example, a stage 3A or a 3B, and you're deciding uh, or you're deciding between a proximal row carpectomy or a partial diffusion, and you put your scope inside, you find that the head of the capitate is also arthritic or you have uh, cartilage damage both in the mid-carpal and the radiocarpal joint, then you would just excise uh, or resect the lunate and perform a scapocavitated fusion. However, if the cartilage is intact in the mid-carpal joint, as well as the radiocarpal joint, especially the lunate fossa, then perhaps a proximal rocopectomy would be a more effective procedure. So if you look at that table, there are different procedures that have been um, uh, recommended for different stages. And we should know that in keen jokes, unfortunately, any, I would say that any condition that has a multitude of options, it goes to say that none of them are robust enough or none of them are effective enough. So I think we use these indications based on the patient requirements, their uh, age and dominance, our experience with these procedures, so on and so forth. So there are several recommendations for each stage, and then we need to factor in all of these uh, important criteria to offer the best outcomes for our patients. The third question is, uh, how far risk scope can be used in limited risk fusion? Very good question. So I think uh, uh, it depends on the indication. So for example, if a patient comes to you with a uh, chronic or a very late presenting uh, Wollobarton fracture, for example, and there is severe arthritis, you can even perform radioscape for lunate fusion. We can perform scaphocapitate fusions. You can perform scaphoid excision and capitolunate fusions. Uh, so I, I have moved away from per performing the so-called four-corner fusion, which is scaphoid, which is scaphoid excision and capitolunate, and then uh, capitohamate and dunotriquetral, uh, and also the uh, hamate and uh, triquetral fusion. So rather than performing four-corner. I just perform a two-corner. We have to pay attention to 
maintaining the disc kinematics and the alignment of the bones. So if you excise the scapula, the lunate is going to go into extension. So you need to correct that extension and then fuse. While you are doing a lunate excision, the scapula would flex. So you extend the scapula and then you perform your scapocapitate fusion. So radio scapula lunate fusion, uh, scapocapitate fusion, and a two-corner fusion are very much possible uh, using wrist arthroscopy. The, and the fourth question is in neglected TFCC ulnar detachment injuries without arthritic changes, uh, especially these cases usually misdiagnosed as wrist sprain and mistreated sometimes for a year. And do you prefer arthroscopy repair? Oh, yes, of course. In fact, I do not now remember the last time we have performed um, an open repair for um, TFCC injuries. I think TFCC injuries now are best treated arthroscopically. Even reconstruction can be performed as an arthroscopy assisted procedure. So when you, whenever you're doing uh, ligament reconstruction using tendon grafts, you can use um, arthroscopic techniques. So the so-called Adam Berger procedure for that matter can be performed arthroscopically. So I, I, I hope I have answered all the questions. And for chronic scaphalunate injuries, how do you uh, use arthroscopic techniques? Right. So um, it is very important to fall back on the Garcia Elias uh, table that we just saw. As long as the scaphoid is reducible, so we have to understand the kinematics of the proximal carpal row. When there is an injury to the scaphoid ligament, the scaphoid has a natural tendency to flex, whereas the trichotrum has a natural tendency to extend. And in doing so, the lunate, which now remains attached to the trichotrum via the lunotrichotal joint, goes into extension, which is called as a DC deformity. And vice versa, when there is a lunotrichotal injury, the scaphoid flexes and takes the lunate into flexion, which is the VC deformity. So we have to, the, the, the pain or the problem in uh, scaphoid injuries is because of the flexion of the scaphoid and the scaphoid trying to jump off the dorsal rim of the, of the, of the distant radius. And that's where the arthritic changes occur. So as long as you're able to reduce or extend the scaphoid and then uh, repair the ligament, you are able to perform most of these techniques arthroscopically. Once this flexion of the scaphoid uh, is static or is, uh, is irreducible, then you would per perhaps have to perform a reconstructive procedure using different techniques that have been described. Can you do a reconstruction using arthroscopic technique as well? Oh, yes. So there are now so many different techniques. The very famous PC host technique, the box ligament reconstruction. You have even uh, ligament 3 uh, LT procedures, the modified uh, techniques using different tendon grafts. So it's not entirely arthroscopy. These are arthroscopy assisted procedures. So you have to make certain incisions, pretty much like the ACL repairs and reconstructions, you know. So you get your graft, you have some open and some arthroscopic uh, assisted techniques. So. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. Wagner. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you sir. so much. Do you have any questions? Sure. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, the, uh, Professor Abhijit. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, the Professor Sernifes. Thank you so much, sir, for this very nice presentation. We enjoyed a lot. Thank you so much, sir. Now we will Thank you to very much. Speaker. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Ahmed Alam, uh, the head of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Faculty of Medicine. Uh, Professor Alam is uh, specialized in uh, uh, upper limb surgery and in uh, reconstruction surgery. Uh, Professor Alam will speak about uh, distal in radius fractures and overview. Professor Alam. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very nice invitation from the Egyptian side, Professor Mohammed Al Ashab, my dear friend and other colleague. And from the Indian side, Professor Sergeyes, thank you very much for this invitation. One moment, please. Trying to share one moment.
I am still with you. Yes. Zoom is not responding. I don't know why. Are you using a Mac or a Windows, sir? No, it is normal Windows. One moment. Yeah. Okay, that it is. Is it sharing yes. now, dear? Yes, it's shared. It's shared, the Professor Alan. Okay, thank you. Let us start. Thank you, sir. I want to this one. Okay, this is Manhai Nubri Hospitals, where I work here in Egypt. I am turning the slides now. It is working, Professor Muhammad. This is a second slide for distal radius fractures. It is working? It's working, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, my talk will be uh, simple to illustrate some remarks about distal radial fractures. It's not working again. I have nothing to disclose. As Professor Muhammad told you, I work in limb lengthening. This is one of my patients after lengthening. Okay. Distal radial fractures are the most common orthopedic injury, generally result from a fall in the outstretched hand. Diagnosis could be made clinically and radiologically. Treatment can be non-operative or operative depending on fracture stability, patient's age, and activity demands. Anatomically, 50% are interarticular. The most important risk factor is osteoporosis. High incidence of distal radius fractures in women above 50 years old. It is a predictor for subsequent fracture if occurring in a female. So DEXA scan is recommended for a woman with distal radial fracture. Associated injuries, distal radio ulnar joint injuries, ulnar styloid fractures, whatever styloid tip, neck, or base, and soft tissue injuries seen in 70% of cases, including triangular fibrocartilage injury, scaphoid unit, unitral ligament injuries. Part of the applied anatomy shows us that the distal radius is responsible for 80% of axial loading. It is articulating with the scaphoid, leonid, and the distal ulna. And it is compromised of three columns. The radial column includes the radial styloid and the scaphoid fossa which functions for attachment site for brachioradialis, some ligaments, and it is a load bearing platform for activities performed with the wrist in the ulnar deviation position. We have also the intermediate column, the lunate fossa, which transmits load from the cardus to the forearm, and the ulnar column, including the triangular fibrocartilage and distal ulna, which is responsible for stability of the distal radio ulnar joint and the forearm rotation. Most common used imaging techniques are radiographs. Recommended views are the AB, lateral, and the oblique. In the AB, usually we are interested in the radial angle, or it is called also radial side inclination or arnal inclination, radial shortening or loss of radial height after fractures, and radial shift, with the, which is the lateral transmission of the styloid and radius frag, fragment after fractures. On the lateral radiograph, the most important two points are the dorsal angle or the volar inclination and the dorsal shift, which also the transmission of the distal segment from the wrong axis of the proximal segment. CT is indicated to evaluate interarticular involvement and for surgical planning, MRI to evaluate soft tissue injury, triangular fibrocartilage injuries. Many, many classifications are described for the distal end radius. As an example, Fernand's based on the mechanism of injury, fragment based on the joint involvement, Melon for the interarticular fractures, and the AO, which is a more comprehensive and sophisticated one. As a simple classification, you know all the fragment classification, type one extraarticular, type two with ulna involved, type three radiocarbal, type five radioalnar, type seven is the radiocarbal, radioalnar, and the eight with the ulna involved. 
Some important definitions are important to be in mind. First, the die bunch fracture. The dorsal medial corner of the ulna is the depressed part opposing the lunate fossa, which occurs most commonly with articular fractures of the distal radius. Its importance comes from it is devoid of ligamentous attachment. So when we do ligamentous taxis, this die punch fragment or die punch part doesn't reduce with ligament taxis, it should need manual reduction. The Barton's fracture is a fracture dislocation of the radiocarbal joint with interarticular fracture, which could be volar or dorsal. Chauffeur fracture is an old name for styloid fracture occurring years ago with the start of cars production. There was no starting for the engine except a handle. The rotation of the handle and the kicking back in the chauffeur's hand causes this famous fracture. So it's still called chauffeur's or radial styloid fracture. Coolis fracture, the most famous name for the low energy dorsally displaced extra articular fracture and the Smith fracture, which is the reverse Coolis fracture. This long introduction because distal radius fractures crush the mechanical foundation of man's most elegant tool, the hand. The impact of old college teaching led many surgeons to refer loosely to any distal radial fracture as a college fracture. Because of its frequency and the impact of the old teaching, it is usually managed by inexperienced junior staff with unfortunate results, obtaining frequently with significant functional deficits. So it is very important to define the unstable distal radial fractures. Criteria for instability are dorsal angulation more than 10 degrees, radial shortening more than five millimeters, significant volar or dorsal comminution, fracture gap or depression more than two millimeters, fracture extension to the radiocarbon and or radio ulnar joint and accompanied ulnar fracture, whatever they cite, neck or distal shaft or tip. The presence of one or more is a criterion for instability and is considered an indication for some type of operative treatment. This is my proposed management algorithm for an unstable distal end radial fracture. If you do close to manipulative reduction and you have good reduction, which is still maintained after releasing traction, you can proceed directly to percutaneous spinning with or without bone grafting. You can make a small dorsal opening and impact the void if you have, in addition to the percutaneous spinning technique you know. If you have good reduction, which displays or shortens on traction release, you should maintain traction by ligament to taxis like external fixation, also plus or minus additional key wires plus or minus bone grafting. If the fracture is still impacted, articular surface incongruity more than one meter or shortening more than five millimeters, you should proceed to open reduction internal fixation or external fixation post open reduction with also additional key wires or bone graft as necessary. So generally talking, the treatment could be non-operative as closed reduction and splint cast immobilization. For extra articular fractures, less than five millimeters radial shortening and dorsal angulation within 20 degrees of contralateral other radius. Or could be operative in the form of closed reduction percutaneous spinning, which indicated in extra-articular fractures with a stable volar cortex, which gives up to 90% good results if used appropriately. We have also open reduction internal fixations for radiographic, radiographic findings indicating instability in presence of severe osteoporosis, articular margin fractures like Barton's fracture, or if we have a critical corner or the volar ulnar corner fracture, which supports the volar leonate facet, because this fracture, if comminuted or depressed, it is easy for the wrist to subluxate or dislocate volarly. 
If we have also comminuted smith fracture or die bunch fracture, as we said before, it is not reducible with ligament root axis. If we have a progressive loss of volar tilt or radial length following closed reduction and recasting. For open reduction internal fixation, the most preferred technique is the volar plating, which is known complications, but the most important is not to forget the watershed area. It is the volar lip of the ulna. So your plate should be short of it and your screws should be directed proximally to avoid penetrating into the articular cartilage and the floor of the scaphoid and the unit fossa. Dorsal plating is indicated for displaced interarticular distal radial fractures with dorsal comminution. Historically, it has the problem of extensor tendon irritation and rupture. For external fixation, it is indicated for open fractures, highly commuted fractures, medically unstable patients unable to undergo lengthy procedures. For percutaneous spinning, we have six basic techniques. As an example, this is a Frickman type 8 radiocarbal, radio ulnar, and ulnar styloid. We have here radio ulnar pin, radial styloid pin, and posterior intrafocal or Cabanchi pin. This is a patient after four months nearly. This is another patient, grade 7 Frickman. This is ulnoradial pin, dorsomedial corner pin, and radial styloid pin. And this is the final of the patient. Another patient, grade six. This is radial styloid, dorsal medial, radio radial pinning, and the ulnar pin for the ulnar fracture. This is the final of the patient. Another patient, type eight fragment. Fragment. This is Cabanji intrafocal technique. Three different pins. This is the final of the patient. This is another patient with grade eight also. All are dorsal, medial, and radioradial pins. This patient was type seven fragment, is treated with the known as Rayhack technique. Rayhack uses the ulna as the stable column to make an internal fixation of fixator or construct, but this is somewhat injurious to the radius and the interosseous contents. I have made a little modification for Rayhack. This is another case. This is my own modification for Rayhack technique, also using the ulna, but with two pins in the distal radius and the two pins in the proximal radius, making an internal fixator. And this is the final of the patient after 18 months. With more fracture comminution displacement, we should do either external fixation in the form of ligamentotaxis or osteotaxis. A lot of configurations could be done using the converging pin technique, parallel pin technique, one bar, two bar, lensing device or solid device, according to the circumstances. This is osteotaxis where the pins are in the bone fragment itself. This is ligamentotaxis with the converging pin technique and using a lengthening device. And this is the final of the patient after one year nearly. This is a real bag of bone. You can't count the number of fragments here. It is impossible to reconstruct by open reduction, but this could be reduced very nicely with ligament to taxis. And this is the final of the patient after 16 months. And this is the shadow of the bone graft put. To conclude, don't do simple manipulation and casting for an unstable distal radial fracture. You can delay operation up to 18 days with no harm. Simple percutaneous spinning or ligament to taxes are very successful. You should mobilize early. So hinge it arthrodiastasis is better to avoid the most common complication, sodex atrophy. The reduction of inherently unstable distal radial fractures must be maintained with percutaneous spinning or distraction fixation. Otherwise, a high complication rate and less favorable final outcome should be expected. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Professor Ahmad Alam, for this very Thank interesting you, presentation about a very common topic. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, my first question will be from me, uh, Professor Alam, uh, to you and uh, also to uh, Professor Abhijit. Uh, in some uh, types of distal radial fractures, such as the uh, die punch fracture, 
uh, can we uh, uh, do it assisted by breast arthroscopy as arthroscopy guided reduction and then we do the uh, our internal fixation you are asking about arthroscopy so the answer is not mine yeah <laughs> uh, well thank you so much for the question uh, professor mohammed i think uh, i reserve wrist arthroscopy when there is a central dive punch and usually you have an intact dorsal and volar margins and then um, you know it's very difficult to really reduce this fragment by any of the techniques. So sometimes you can even use a joystick from a dorsal cortical window and then elevate that fragment up using a freer elevator. Uh, wrist arthroscopy only ensures that the reduction will, this can also be done with fluoroscopic control. And I think when people have as much of experience as Professor Ahmed has or you have, it may become a cinch. But there are certain indications uh, wherein uh, wrist arthroscopy specifically is important in diagnosing and dealing intra-articular ligament injuries, which may be associated so frequently with these injuries. So I think where wrist arthroscopy stands out as a uh, as a very effective adjunct to treating this fragment, these fractures is identification of ligament injuries, which may otherwise, which may jeopardize the outcome in uh, otherwise very well reduced and fixed fracture. So I, I hope that I'm able to highlight this point in this answer. For me, I have, I have no experience with wrist arthroscopy, but as you said, we can elevate it with a small proster elevator or some blunt tool and put a bone graft to support it and maintain whatever you maintain with percutaneous spinning, fixator, plate, whatever, and usually it goes nice. Yeah. Absolutely. You have a question, sir. Yeah. Uh, you are muted, sir. Dr. Sonivas, you are muted. Yes, Thank sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, just a follow-on for uh, Dr. Wahegaonkar. Um, what would be your definitive fixation? Would that be plating? And how would you manage scopy and plating if uh, you're going to do plate? So the provisional fixation is with K-wires, and now there are so many amazing devices and implants that are available. So we have a time plate, we have specific plates for uh, volar uh, corner fractures, we have um, the fragment, the pins and plates that are available, we have fragment-specific fixation devices. So I think there's a paraphernalia of these implants that are available, but the humble K-wire uh, is perhaps um, one of the most um, amazing devices and they can be used either for um, a provisional fixation when you want to get in your device. So you do your arthroscopic reduction, provisional fixation with a KY, and then you use a definitive fixation with these low uh, profile implants along with the bone graft. For a lot of subchondral depressed fractures, a bone graft that is counter to that cortical window which supports the subchondral bones is often enough to provide you the stability that you're looking for. And then an additional K-wire might help. So sometimes K-wire can also be used as definitive fixation until the fracture is healed as was shown in uh, the talk by Professor Ahmad Vainigo. So okay. it all depends upon the availability um, uh, the the comfort uh, that the surgeon has with those implants, the training for that matter. Uh, but the plating is usually done once the reduction is assessed arthroscopically. There are traction devices that can put the vertical arm uh, into a horizontal position without losing the traction as well. But if you do not have those devices, this can very well be done once the provisional fixation will ensure that your reduction will stay in place. Yes, sir. Uh, my you. second question to uh, Professor Ahmed. Um, if you are going to do a uh, ligamento Texas by external fixator, Professor Alam, yeah. and uh, you are not convinced with the, uh, the, re the reduction, uh, do you proceed to open reduction or you use a K wire as a joystick, as a, uh, Professor Afijit said, and you are trying to make a close the reduction, a closed assessed reduction? What do you think, sir? Actually, you should try having K wire reduction first making joystick manipulations, and usually it is succeeded because you have two problems in community fractures to collect these bones in the in intact bag, the osteum, 
and to maintain length with the distraction. Sometimes you have some bones going this way or that way. You can push it or reduce it in place with the K-wire and maintain it like so. Usually you succeed in that. Rarely to need to make an open reduction and internal fixation in association with an external fixator. Yes. Uh, what about osteotaxis, sir? Can you depend on the, the distal fragment to hold the, the uh, wires or the uh, shunt bands in external fixator? If the bone is not so osteoporotic, if the fracture is only two-part fracture or it is extra-articular, yeah, you can depend on it. You fix it if it is intra-articular, split in two parts. You fix it with provisional key wires, then put your pins, then you make the other pins approximately, and of course, you don't make distraction. You just do opposition or little compression at the fracture side to have the osteotaxis reduction. But you, again, you should have extra articular or minimally comminuted or two part fracture to use it. And of course, of sizable fragment to have at least two pins. Yes, if we yes, have, sir. sir. Please, please, sir. Uh, sir, how do you uh, manage those patients with uh, uh, associated ulna styloid fractures? Yeah, uh, okay. just asking this question. Yeah, yeah. Usually, ulnar tip styloid fracture is left nothing to be done for it. If it is ulnar base and it is placed, fine K wire could, could be placed inside it. And as many literature said, it usually unites in only for 60 to 70 percent of cases, not all cases unite. And most cases, if it is in place and the radiocarb, uh, the triangular fiber is good, goes well with good dysfunction. But if it is a sizable fragment, you should fix it with a key wire. Yes. And if we have a concomitant soft tissue injuries, uh, do you uh, manage uh, in the same setting or, or you do a conservative management or you, you make a second stage uh, management of these soft tissue injuries? Usually, if we are making a closed percutaneous spinning or external fixator, we wait for healing. If it is going good, we leave it. If it is some residual complications, it need a late surgery at better circumstances, not in the acute phase. Yes. Yes. Uh, if we have any questions from uh, our uh, colleagues and our attendees. How, how long do you maintain your X fixer, sir? And when do you mobilize the wrist? Okay. Uh, usually we maintain it from six to eight weeks. Usually they are enough. Uh, about mobilization, if you are using a hinged frame like the Clyde Bernie modality, you can mobilize the wrist uh, after three weeks. You just be sure that you make the cora or the center of rotation of the head of capitate, the center of rotation of the wrist, to mobilize the wrist safely without affecting the reduction. So two, three weeks, we can do that under your supervision. Or you can, after having radiological callus from three to four weeks, you can loosen the frame and passively mobilize the wrist gently and reattach the frame again and retighten it. Don't leave it loose for the patient at home. But usually the wrist can withstand fixation from six to eight weeks safely and regains good in a few periods of physiotherapy after that. Yes, we have a question for you, Dr. Uh, Ahmad from uh, Dr. Ahmad Adli. Uh, what about tension band of ulnar styloid? To do a tension band, you should have a big size fragment. This big size fragment could be reduced with single small screw with a washer or can use it with a KOR also. If you wanted to do it, I think this is, from my own opinion, it is over treatment. Yes. Because you have the risk of uh, fracturing it into several fragments. Uh, if we have any other, any other questions from our uh, attendees. Somebody has raised a hand, sir. Yes, if you can uh, write your question, Dr. Salah, please. If you can write your question, the question answer uh, box, please. What about those... Uh, far, you know, very uh, distal radial fractures, which are very close to the articular surface. How, how do you manage them? Uh, say comminuted, um, uh, but not intra-articular. Um, 
but they are very far, uh, uh, very distal to the, uh, close to the articular surface of the radius. You mean subarticular fractures, but not yes. articular. Yeah. yeah. I think the best solution is percutaneous pain. Yeah. If there is hazardous way to treat it, because it is not manual for fixation with plate and screws. It is not for uh, external fixator. KOR fixation is more than enough for these cases. It is still can seal as bone. It can heal well and rapidly. Yeah, I think uh, we have no more questions. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, thank you so much. Yeah, we have one yes, question uh, from Dr. Mustafa. How do you manage distal radius fractures in complicated diabetics? In diabetics, the rule differs in that you should be careful of the condition of the skin, of the circulation, of the liability more of infection. So it is the usual techniques, but more care is attended to the technique, sophistication, and to the antibiotic prophylaxis, the pain care, if you are using pins. Like any part in the body, this is, this is not a charcoal, this is only a diabetic patient. So you just take your care of your skin and your pins. But it doesn't differ in, in any way. Sometimes it have a longer time in bone healing, but it doesn't make a lot of difference. And how do you manage your malunions with an ulnar plus or uh, uh, ulnar plus deformities? Again, sir? Malunions of distal radius. Yeah. With ulnar plus deformities. Okay. About malunion. If the radio ulnar joint is working good, we should lengthen the radius either acutely or gradually. And during lengthening, we should correct all the parameters we talk about in the AB and the lateral, the ulnar tilt, the vulnerable inclination, and the radio ulnar relationship or height in relation to the other wrist by comparison. If the distal radio ulnar joint is disrupted, you have the option of reconstruction or you can. Um, discuss with the patient the rapid option of excision of the ulna with the old techniques like dark. This is patient related and technique related. Some patients prefer the long procedure time to have normal functioning list. Others prefer to work after a few days. It doesn't uh, bother him to have some deformity, but he wants a good grip and a good rotation in his forearm. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Now we come to the end. Uh, at the end, I would like to thank uh, Professor Abhijit from India for his uh, very interesting presentation about uh, rest arthroscopy. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmed, Professor Ahmad Alam from Egypt. Many thanks to my dear friend, uh, Dr. Sernivas, for his great effort. And uh, see you next Friday. Our speaker will be Dr. Sernivas next Friday. And also from uh, the Egyptian side, Professor uh, Osama Ghazi, one of uh, our eminent uh, speakers. Uh, Professor Sinibes will speak about early osteoarthritis of the knee, and Professor uh, Osama Ghazi will speak about the uh, non arthroplastic treatment of osteoarthritis of the knee. Thank you so much. Uh, have Thank a nice you. time, and see you again. Thank, Thank you so much Thank for you. your uh, acceptance of our Thank invitation. You. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank An you. honor. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night.